Welcome to Christ Chapel College, the college outreach of Christ Chapel Bible Church in Fort Worth, Texas. We hope everyone experiences what Jesus calls abundant life. So we unapologetically point to Him as the source of life and joy. If you're a college student in the Fort Worth area, we'd be stoked to connect with you. Find out more at ChristChapelCollege.org and on Instagram at Christ Chapel College. Friday, I almost got in a fight at Walmart. I was at Walmart, 80-year-old woman, right? The greeter, those, you know who I'm talking about, the like 90-year-old women who greet at Walmart. Let me back up. <clears throat> there I am. It's my son's birthday uh, party is Friday. So I go and I pick up, I'm, my job is to go and pick up all these boys after school and take them. We're going to play laser tag and have the greatest nine-year-old birthday party of all time. That's my job. So my other job is while he's at school, I got to go pick up uh, cupcakes. And so because I'm a cheap dad, I go to Walmart to buy cupcakes, go to Walmart, get my cupcakes, get some other snacks, things like that. And then underneath my cart, I get cases of water, right? Cases of water for the party and all that kind of stuff. Well, it's all self-checkout at Walmart. So I go and I self-checkout and I'm a pastor, so I don't steal that much. And so I was taking it and I would check it out and put it in the bags and all of the stuff is in the bag. And then I got the gun and I shot the little water barcodes too, but I'm not going to put them in a bag, right? You leave them in the bottom of the cart, put the gun away, you know, pay, you know, swipe the car, do the whole thing, pushing the cart, right? Get 50 yards. This woman standing in front of me, she's like 163 years old. She looks at me and she's like, receipt. And I knew she was asking for my receipt, but I could see her in her eyes. She was saying, let's fight. That's what I could tell just in her eyes, her almost dead eyes. I could see it. And so I'm like looking for my receipt and I can't find it. And I'm like checking my pockets and I'm looking in the cart. And I'm like, I know I bought this stuff. And she's like, especially for the waters, like the waters aren't in a bag. And I'm like, cracking my knuckles at this point and I'm getting ready and she's harassed me and then I see I had crumpled up the receipt and I'd put it in a bag and so I got it and I was like boom and she had a heart attack and fell over none of that happened um I was very kind I'm a pastor I was sweet that was embellishment for the story's sake we've all been in that place though right where we we maybe have purchased something you bought something you did something you know you did it and then, and then you get to the place and you're like, okay, cool. Do you have proof of that? Like, do you have a receipt? Do you have your ticket? Do you, and it's like, well, I know. I literally, I just bought it. 50, I'm l- putting my card back in my wallet while I'm walking. And there's this, up, there's this feeling of like, okay, where is the evidence of that? What we're talking about today is this letter to Galatians, the, the, the Galatian church. And in it is these people who have received the gospel, which is that there was a massive debt that they owed a huge debt that separated them from a holy and perfect God, right? A debt that they couldn't pay, and yet what they received was the good news that Jesus Christ, God incarnate, came and lived the life that they were supposed to live and died the death that they were supposed to die and then raised again, and for those who put their faith in Christ, their debt is fully paid, and they now have a new king and a new Lord, and that's Jesus. That was what they had received, and so they had received this faith, and yet the book that we're studying this semester is all about these people who have received, the debt is paid, and yet they drift, and they change, and, and they wonder, wait, where, wait, maybe I, maybe, I do, maybe I didn't. I don't know where the proof of that is. I don't know if my debt got paid, and so it's a people, it's a church that Paul is writing to saying, quit trying to continue to pay. I mean, it would be like going through Walmart and you, you buy your stuff and then 50 yards later, you get to the, the receipt checker and she says, do you have your receipt? And you go, I, well, I don't know. And you start handing her more money. Th- there's a broken, there's a, there's a confusion where, wait, you have paid. And so that's what's happening. And so I, I get really excited about this passage. We're gonna be in chapter three, verses one through 14. So we're just studying 14 verses today. And in it, I really believe it helps us answer the question of, how do we know, right? Like, how do you know you did it right, right? If, if, if this massively important thing called our salvation, our reuniting with an eternal and holy God is through faith in Jesus, what if you did it wrong? What if you didn't pray the right thing or what if it didn't really go through? Where is the receipt for that, that we can say, here it is? And, and, and this sermon isn't all about, there's a whole topic called assurance of our salvation, which is something that, that as Christians, we can have confidence in that, but this isn't all about that. It's not all of the ways we can be sure, but today you're gonna see a big one. You're gonna see a, a, a huge aspect of what God has done to say, here is how you can be confident. Here is a receipt for this faith that we uh, are called to have. Ready for this? Galatians 
chapter 3, verse 1. It's going to be 14 verses, like I said, and I'm going to break it into three different sections. Uh, and I'm going to give kind of some headings just for me. I, I have to kind of wrap my head around what the argument is that Paul's making in each of these sections. So maybe it's helpful to you. It's definitely how I read scripture. I have to kind of figure out, okay, what's he talking about in this section? So the first section is going to be the first six verses. And section one, it's, it's really where Paul is calling them out for leaving their original faith. So he's going to come in hot in these verses. And so here he is calling them out uh, in their faith. Verse 1, chapter 3. O foolish Galatians, he starts. Who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Let me, let me, unpack, let me unpack this a little bit. Um, and really what we're going to see here is this question, why are you walking away from the faith? That's what Paul is saying. He's telling this church, this group of people who he shared Christ with in the first place. Their original faith was because Paul showed up, the Holy Spirit spoke through him, shared this good news of Christ, and yet then he's checking back in. They've walked away, and he's saying, why have you walked away? Right? You're leaving your original faith, and for clarity, let me um, explain what I mean by that. When, when I say um, they're leaving their original faith, their original faith was this. It was in Christ alone that we are saved. That's the message of, of ultimately Christianity, right? That's the message of the gospel, that it is Christ alone who saves you, not your religious deeds, not your church attendance, not, um, n- not anything else that we try to find to make us right with God. It's only through Christ alone. Um, and they didn't ditch Jesus. The Galatians were still all about Jesus. They love Jesus. They're big fans of Jesus. What they were doing was they were adding to it. And so it was no longer Christ alone. It was, yes, Jesus is what saves me. But I've also got to do this, and I've also got to do this, and I probably should also do this, and I need to do this to also be made right with God. And so uh, they really were wandering from that original call. um, And what they were doing is what they were adding is they were adding the law, which is something we've talked a lot about in here. And the law was really the standard. It was the standard. It was the rules, um, in in essence, of this is what it looks like to be uh, righteous. And really, the law was this gift that God gave us to show us how impossible it was. The law is a gift to say, hey guys, here's the standard of righteousness. By the way, you'll never get there and that's gonna produce dependence and faith in me because I will get you there. And and so that's really what was happening. They were like, okay, I guess we gotta fill all of these laws out too. Um, The law's not bad, it's just inadequate. And faith in Christ alone is, is where, what we need for righteousness, but they left it. And he even says in verse one, you guys witnessed it, right? They were leaving their original faith and they, they witnessed it. He even says, you've, you've received evidence of the Holy Spirit in your life, which the Spirit of God has talked about three times in this verse. And so it's a topic that we're gonna, when we get to application, we're gonna come back into this specific section and we're gonna spend some time on just that. So put a pin in that. But he's, he's using the spirit even as, a, as this evidence of what are, you, what are you doing? Like the spirit of God was doing stuff. You had it. Why did you leave it? You saw the effects of your belief. And then he goes into the second section and he really talks about how their original faith was the original plan, right? It was always God's plan in these next three verses. Verse seven. Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, in you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed, along with Abraham, the man of faith. Let me explain what's happening here. Um, Abraham would have been the father, they would have seen him as the father of the Jews. And he's speaking to an audience that would have really understood what this meant because he's speaking to an audience that has Jews in it, yes, but it's also full of Gentiles. And basically in, in this reference, you are a Jew, that's a, that's a, a genetic thing, that's a, that's a race, right? The Jewish people, the Hebrew people. And then everyone who wasn't a Jew falls into the category of Gentiles. Most of us probably in this room, and unless you're a Jew by birth, we would fall into the categories of Gentiles. 
Well, God had been telling his story through the Jewish people throughout history, right? Through the people of Abraham, God had said, I'm gonna reveal myself through the Jewish people. And, and even this promise to Abraham way, 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 way back before Jesus, way back before we're sitting in a coffee shop today, Abraham was this guy that God gave this promise to, in you, all the nations shall be blessed which is crazy encouraging that that promise was spoken to a man thousands of years ago, prophetically, God saying, I'm going to bless all the nations who lived in a nation way on the other side of the ocean. And that is now what we sit in, in a coffee shop on Sunday morning, worshiping Jesus, who came through the line of Abraham, through the promise of the Jewish people, because this was always God's plan to save everybody. This wasn't a curveball, Paul is saying. This was always the original plan. God was going to reach everybody. So way over here in this nation, way far away from Israel, right? we were a part of God's plan to say, I want to reach everyone and throughout, throughout history. And so he's saying that's what's happening. God wasn't surprised. God wasn't like, oh man, I guess I got to open up the gospel to other people. It was always the plan. And so here you had a whole bunch of Gentiles in Galatians who were thinking, well, man, we weren't born Jews, but we know Jesus was a Jew, and we know all of the original kind of followers of Jesus were Jews, so uh, are we missing it? Like, should we be Jews? That's part of what they were adding to the gospel. They were thinking, okay, I guess I need to be more Jewish now if I really want to f- follow Christ, and there were, it sounds like some people even in their community that were like, yeah, yeah, you should probably be more Jewish if you really, really want to be right with God. Paul's saying, no, 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 it's not about being Jewish. It's not about following the list of things. It's about faith in Jesus. That's what makes us, makes us right. And he's gonna get to that here in the bottom line. Um, the bottom line, this third section is really what he's, what he's doing in verses 10 through 14 um, is he's, he's cautioning and, and showing the correction of the faith. He's bringing them back to this is the correct faith. And so look with me, I, I love this passage. This will be the, the last little thing that we kind of camp out as a text and then we'll walk back all the way through it for application. Paul says, for all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it's written, cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Now it's evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith, rather the one who does them shall live by them. And then verse 13 and 14, I love. He says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it's written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. This is so rich. I want you to see a few things here. Verse 10, we see Paul saying, you're relying on works right? How well they're keeping the rules, how well they're living up to the standard. And and when we rely on works instead of faith, one, you will get exhausted, right? If if you came in here, and, and even if it's not conscious, but there is a subconscious draw for us. I don't know if it's about, you know, being Americans that have to do everything. If, if you are an American in this room, I don't know if it's, if it's just a pride thing. I don't know if it's a South thing. I don't know if it's a Christian thing, but there's something wired in us that says, I've got to earn this. I've got to earn everything else in our life. Every other worldview, every other religion, every other religion is going to say, hey, this, our pathway is just a different way to earn it. Here's our prophet. This is what he says, how you get there. Uh, everything else, you got to earn your grades. If you're trying to win over a girl, you got to earn the girl. You got to earn the guy. You got to earn the, the respect from your parents or the boss or earn the job. Everything else in our life is this, this struggle to, I got to earn it. And, and those aren't necessarily evil things. And then he comes along and says, you're relying on trying to earn it. You're relying on trying to do a bunch of religious things, check all these boxes to earn it. And he says, that's not, that's not how it works. You're just going to be under a curse. You're not going to earn it. Christ, righteousness comes from faith. Christ redeemed us from the curse because Christ Jesus 2,000 years ago became the curse. He took on the curse. He took on my debt. He took on your sin. He took on how far you fall short of what it looks like to be made right with a holy and perfect God that you were designed to be in relationship with. And every moment of your life that you're not connected to that God, 
starts to fill in that void of anxiety and fear and loneliness and temporary pleasure to cope with that and numb that, just distract yourself. But we are designed to be connected and Jesus came and he bridged that gap. Verse 13, he redeemed us from the curse. Jesus became the curse. Is there faith in that? That's the gospel. That's what Paul is reminding them. That's what Paul is reminding us. Do you believe that? Have you put your faith in that? We believe in a triune God. And what I mean by that is we believe God in three persons, that there is a father that we're supposed to be in a relationship with who is holy and perfect, and we can't get there. And he sent his son who was holy and perfect, God incarnate in human form, who lived the life, died the death, rose again, and now stands at the right hand of God. And if we put our faith in him and say, yes, that's my only hope, then what happens is the Holy Spirit then comes and fills us. He then sends his spirit to fill us. And that triune God, that God, three gods in one person then, is what we worship. It shapes our identity. It sets us free. All of those things, that's what we sign up for. Not religion, not church, not doing all the right things. A relationship with God through faith that changes everything. If you're in this room, you're in one of two camps. These are pretty broad camps. You might be in this room, and I know there are people in this room, who the the gospel that I just shared, the fact that you will not earn your righteousness, you will not earn right standing with God by how sober you are, by how moral you are, by how Christian you are, by, by the things you do, you cannot do that. And that is so contrary to oftentimes what, what other religions preach and, and oftentimes what other religious organizations will, will share at you. And, and you're in here and you think, wait, it's only by faith. You hear me say that. It has nothing to do with me. It has nothing to do with the words I say. But there are people in this room who that's the first time you've heard that, like that. The gospel is about grace. A holy God who said, stop trying to earn it and trust me. Put your faith in Jesus. And if that's you, if you're in that camp and you've heard religion and you've done this and you've heard you know, the scale that you got to tip, do more good things than bad, and that's how you earn it, and, and now you're hearing all of that's bogus, all of that's going to leave you exhausted, all of that's going to ultimately leave you empty and unsatisfied and unconnected to the God of the universe, then it's not an accident you're here. Listen to me. It's not an accident you're here. I believe that it has nothing to do with me. You were supposed to be in this room this morning. I believe it. I believe the Holy Spirit. That might sound really creepy and weird to you, I think God wanted you in this room because he said, he said, this is my girl. This is my guy. And they're trying to do all these things and there's an emptiness in them and there's a loneliness in them that I'm designed to fill and you have a God of the universe who said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make them wander into a coffee shop at 11 o'clock and they're gonna hear my gospel. And then the Holy Spirit, if they choose to follow me, is gonna fill them and they're gonna change everything. And my hope is that you don't leave here unchanged eternally. I, I know there are people in, that, in this room who are in that camp. I love you're here. And if you still have so many questions before you can say yes to that, I really respect that also. You're like, okay, I think you're talking to me right now. I think the Holy Spirit is poking me right now, but I got a ton of questions. Good, guess what? We're always here. We're always here. We'd love to talk to you. We'd love to pray with you afterwards. You can DM us. We'd love to just walk with you. There's no, there's no rush on this. This is God's timing and you. We're not trying to sell you anything. We just want to introduce you to a God that changes everything. That's one camp. The other camp is this. The other camp is the person who's in this room who says, yep, heard the gospel, received the gospel, but man, I think I've wandered from it. And that, I am in that camp. Right, there are times in my life where I, I am very much in the Galatians camp. I still love Jesus and like Jesus, but then all of a sudden I look up and I'm like, oh, I'm just adding. I am trying to earn. I am trying to find my identity in other things that aren't working. Um, and I, I love that. That is, that is the challenge of the Galatians church. We've heard it. We've received it. We believed it. And then we walk away. And then we choose these other things that really kind of indicate, do we believe it? with the way I just lived, with what I just did, with what just came out of my mouth, do I believe that Jesus really is my king and my life really is submitted? Golly, because what Ben just said while driving in traffic sure didn't feel like it. And so then all of a sudden you have to, that's scary. That should be a healthy, not a fire and brimstone, everyone, everyone get really scared and we turn the lights red here, but we should stop and say there's a lot at stake here. And Do we believe 
do I have my receipt? Right? Do, do I have good evidence? I mean, I think I prayed the prayer. I mean, I've prayed it multiple times just to kind of double check. Like, what am I banking on? How can I be confident that I'm not leaving the faith? Like the Galatians, the Jesus loving people, but added to it. How can I be confident? How can I be confident I found the right faith in the first place that it stuck? Christ redeemed us, verse 13 said, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. Our faith in Jesus is our hope for redemption, right? Your hope for redemption is your faith in Jesus and Jesus alone. That's the only hope we've got. But then look at verse 14. That's verse 13, really explicitly. But verse 14, I'm gonna read it over you and then I'm gonna summarize it on that screen. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. The spirit of God is an evidence of that faith, guys. Verse 14 shows us there's a receipt and that receipt is named the Holy Spirit. Man, if the father has sent his son and I've put my faith in that son, then, then what happens is I then receive the Holy Spirit and that changes everything. That means if you're in Christ, you have the Spirit of God living in you. That is huge. And yet we do not talk about the Holy Spirit that much because it's weird. And if we talk about the Holy Spirit too much, people are gonna get weird and they're gonna do weird stuff and it's gonna get really feelings and vibey in here and that's gonna get uncomfortable. And so there's a lot of confusion about, well, what is the Spirit of God? How do I know if I, if I'm a believer, part of my receipt, one of the things I could say yes is I should have a Spirit of God in me, but is it there? And, And sometimes it feels like it is and what does it do? And so I'm gonna spend the next, I got about 11 minutes left. I'm gonna spend the next 11 minutes just digging through that assurance and back through these 14 verses of how do we see the Spirit working? How do we know? How do we know what the Spirit looks like? Are we doing this right? Um, And and here's one way I want to illustrate this. Um, If we're in Christ, then it means we've, I'm a real visual person, so I I need visuals. Um, If we are in Christ, then it means that we've put our faith in, in Jesus, not just a not just an intellectual belief. Um, we've, we've surrendered our lives. We've said, yeah, Jesus is king, right? And well, what happens when that happens is the Holy Spirit then fills us, which we see in Scripture, right? We, we see that in Scripture. I even let me reference Ephesians uh, is a great verse. Paul wrote this letter to the Galatians, so he wrote this letter to the Ephesians, different church, but listen to how familiar this is. He said the same thing to the Galatians, just slightly different. In chapter one in, in Ephesians, he said, in him... You also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, when you heard that gospel and believed in him, were sealed by the promised Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. You have this Holy Spirit living in you if you are in Christ that is pumping through you, that is this thing that, that, that has multiple roles, and we're not going to do a deep dive in all of what the Holy Spirit is um, and all of what the Holy Spirit does, but we're going to do a deep dive into what these 14 verses show us about the Holy Spirit. But here's the thing that is convicting for me. I have the Holy Spirit in my life. I believe that, and I've, I've experienced that, but here's what happens. Um, this dims, right? this dims in, in my life. And so all of a sudden I look up and I'm like, yeah, I got the Holy Spirit, but he's just, he's not like, not like it was during the summer. And during the summer I was, but now like I got distracted, I'm busy at school and this stuff and that, and I'm, you know, and I went to Walmart and that sucked the spirit out of me and all of those things, right? And it starts to distract, it starts to dim us, right? And all of a sudden we start looking at this thing and we're, in fact, kill the lights. We start looking at this thing and right now this bulb, I'm telling you, I have a dimmer in my hand, is on, and you could barely see it, right? Like right there, like you in the back, you can't see it, right? But th- there is electricity pumping through this light. Maybe the people in the front row can see it. I can see it. But man, you got to really squint when it's designed to be this. When we're designed to be filled with the Holy Spirit, and it does multiple things. And ultimately, it makes much of Jesus in the life and the world around us, in our own hearts, transformation, some things we're going to talk about. But so often our lives look like this. And we squint and we think, is that even, is the spirit even moving in me? All right, you can turn the lights back on. Thank you. Um, it, it's important, right? This is on right now. There are 
some of us in this room, we're saved, right? It doesn't ever go off, right? If you are saved, if you're in Christ, man, you're his. We believe that. You are a son. You are a daughter. Nothing changes that, right? Nothing changes that. You are sealed in that way. But you're missing out on a life filled with the Spirit. And so you can live your life, and technically, yes, it is current going through this, but it's not really making an impact, not making an impact internally or externally. And so that's, that's where we're going. And I want you to remember that visual to say, God, where am I at? And not just as a one-time summer camp thing, but in our, my life, God, how do I cultivate that more and more? How do I, how do I increase the dimmer more and more on those things? Um, here's what I want us to do. I want us to work backwards, right? We're going to see a three other references. We see a reference in verse 14 of the Holy Spirit, and then I want us to work back into that first section, backwards through that, and you're going to see three things the Holy Spirit is doing, and I want to challenge you and challenge my own uh, forgetful heart to step into those. First, I'm going to take us to verse 5. If you remember chapter 3, verse 5, we'll put it up on the screen. Remember, Paul's coming in hot, and he says, does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? And so what he's saying is he's saying, hey, are you serious? You're walking away from the faith. Remember the effects of the Spirit of God. Remember the Spirit of God that, I, that was sent to you by the Father uh, and all of the miracles and the things that he was doing around you? By faith, don't you remember that? How have you wandered from that? And really the question that I have to ask myself, I have to ask you, are you aware of the spirit of God working around your life? Right now, in in your life, are you aware? Are you seeing the spirit of God? The Galatians had lost sight of that. These people had lost sight of the spirit of God working and they apparently, God was doing amazing stuff. The spirit of God was doing amazing stuff and and they'd lost sight of it. They'd kind of wandered from that for us who are believers, desire to be believers. Are you aware of the spirit of God working around your life? And and here's what I mean by that, um, because I think there's a lot of misconceptions. And so what I want to do for each of these is I want to, I want to kind of say, here's what the spirit does. And then here's what the spirit doesn't do. And so if you're in this camp or if you, or if you've got somebody kind of giving you bad advice, this isn't what the spirit is. The spirit of God makes Jesus famous, right? Not the spirit of God makes makes me famous, makes us famous, everything else. The spirit of man does that. The spirit of God, though, when it's working around you, is going to make Jesus famous. And let me give you some examples tangibly of like, what what do I do with that? What does that mean? I think community is a big one. Unity, unity within a community of people that make no sense, right? Like, if you've got a community of people who are filled with the Holy Spirit, there should be if, if they're active and, and listening and submitted to that spirit, there should be a unity around people that you look at and you're like, how are those guys such good friends? How are those people connected in such a tight community? Right? Like, How do people that don't really have any business liking each other love each other and serve each other that well in a way that an outsider walks in and they don't just think, ah, oh, those are some friendly people. Right? The church, the body of Christ should be people that aren't just like, yeah, they're very welcoming, they're very friendly. It should be like, who are these people? There's something different about them. There's something unifying about them, right? That's a way that, but what they do is they don't think they're nice people. They think this, they're onto something. It should point to Jesus. If it just makes much of us, well, then that's not the spirit of God. If you, honestly, if you leave here and you think, that was a great sermon, that Ben guy, well, then that's not the spirit of God. The spirit of God is never going to say, wow, Ben is great. Wow, that song, man, that lyric, that, right, that person was great. The Spirit of God, what he's going to do around you is make Jesus great. And so what are those things, right? I I know people who serve and they're reaching the marginalized and people who are hurting and they're sacrificing like crazy to do that. That's the Spirit of God making Jesus famous. These incredible things around us that we should be a part of. Here's what I want to challenge you with. Genuinely, I want to challenge you this week. If you want to, to continue, just like I do, just like I need as a pastor, man, I need this to continue to increase that, that dimmer in our life, I want to challenge you. Look for and cultivate the ways the Spirit of God is amplifying Christ and his kingdom. I know that was a mouthful. Look for around you. Look around you and say, where is the Spirit of God moving in a way that is amplifying, that is making loud Jesus? Where, what is he doing? Maybe you... Maybe you see a service opportunity. Maybe you see people who are hurting. Maybe you see people who are lonely and the spirit of God is like, man, I want you to be a part of that. Or maybe you see other people serving 
And you're like, that guy is different. That girl is different. The way they serve, the way, what is happening around me because of these people is different and I wanna be a part of it. It's comfortable to not be a part of it. It's comfortable to stay here and stay safe. I wanna challenge you this week, look for those ways and then cultivate those ways. This, the spirit of God is doing it. Get out of your comfort zone, man. Experience what God might be doing in places that he doesn't need you. He doesn't need us to serve people and love people and, and bring about his revival. He, he doesn't need us, but he chooses to use us. And how crazy are we when we turn him down? When we're like, yeah, I'm good. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna stay where it's comfortable. I challenge you, go, go. Verse three, also, are you so foolish? Again, Paul is strong in his language. He says, are you so foolish? Having begun by the spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? You, you began, it's a rhetorical question. He's saying, okay, the spirit of God is what saved you in the first place. And now is it something else that's gonna like keep you going, sustain you, mature you, right? That fancy word is sanctify. You've been saved, but now you're gonna be matured and sanctified. He's like, no, of course not. It's the spirit of God that should be working in us. The same spirit that was there when the first current hit us is still there and that's what we have to submit to to say God when I make much of Jesus would he be Lord of my life and so the question is for you and for me is the spirit of God working within your life not just is he working externally and, and jumping into opportunities where where he's doing stuff but is he working internally in your life in your heart is God bringing about forgiveness that doesn't make sense healing peace. I'm not going to hijack from our Galatians. We're going to speak in Galatians 5 about a lot of the fruits of what happens with the Spirit, but I, I want to at least give you this kind of juxtaposition. What the Spirit of God will do, he's all about transforming hearts, right? The Spirit of God is all about transforming your heart, but, but what is not the Spirit of God is all about feelings, and we get this one mixed up a lot, right? Like we, we, a lot of times, in fact, I would imagine when I first started talking about the spirit of God, there's about half of you guys that would have been like, right? Like, okay, spirit of God is feelings. Like the first thing I think of when I think of like the Holy Spirit, that person of the Trinity is feelings and the vibe and energy and like, oh man, that's like when I'm really happy. And, and, and that's not who the spirit of God is, right? The, the spirit of God is a, is a God who, who shows up in our life even when things are dim and dark. Um, there's a story I like to tell all the time. I used to travel and work at conferences and youth camps and things like that, and there was this worship band that we worked with um, a good amount, and they were awesome and just great. And, you know, there's a bunch of high school kids, like a 1,000 high school kids worshiping, and they're just jamming out, leading all these worship songs. And I remember standing with the worship leader uh, one evening after a service, and we were chatting, and a high school kid walked up. And I, I think I've told this story before, so I apologize if you've heard it, um, but it's a good story. This kid goes, bro, thanks so much, man. I felt the Holy Spirit. In that last song you played, I felt the Holy Spirit fall. Like I just felt him, felt him fall on me. And the guy was like, I don't really know that that's like our theology. Like, we don't, like the Holy Spirit is not a feeling or like a smoke or a mist or a magic powder that needs to fall in the room. The Holy Spirit is this thing that lives inside of us. And he's not going into all that. That's just my context. And, and he's like, I don't, I don't think that, he's like, you know, no, it was in that last song, man. I, I felt the Holy Spirit move. And he goes, well, what part of the song? He's like, oh, the bridge, man. We went to the bridge. And he was like, and the guy, the worship leader with this high school kid was like, no, 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 that's the bass drum. And the kid's like, no, 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 man, I felt it. And he's like, was it when it was, yeah, okay, yeah, that's the bass drum. You're confusing the bass drum with the Holy Spirit. And we do that all the time. We, we confuse the synthesizer, right, with the Holy Spirit. Like, oh, that's when I felt it, man, right, when you hit that note. Oh, because it becomes a feeling. It's not. Hey, listen, listen to me. <laughs> there is something in the Christian life called the dark night of the soul, Right? If you play this thing out and you follow Jesus with, their li with your life, there are going to be moments in your life where you do not feel all happy. And that has nothing to do with the Holy Spirit not being bright in your life. The most godly people in Scripture, men and women in the Bible, experience some of the hardest, lowest, discouraging times where it wasn't all about feelings and look how happy I am and if we qu equate the Holy Spirit to happiness we will be chasing something and when we catch it it will we will realize it was it was fool's gold right that 
they were close to the Lord. They were closer than they'd ever been. And it wasn't happiness, everything's all right. But it was the presence of the Spirit of God. It was peace in the midst of low, hard, dark times. Man, I want you to be prepared for maturity in your faith. Not be a bunch of people that say, man, we need the Spirit of God, so let's crank the music loud and let's get feeling. If we start feeling sad, no, no, let's just stuff that down. Man, the Spirit of God is not feelings. It's about transforming your heart. The things I used to be addicted to, praise God, he's taken, he's restored. The way I used to see people, he's, he's changed and slowly transforming Right, changing my heart, giving me peace where there shouldn't have been peace and joy and, 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 and all of this kindness when I don't want to respond in kindness, when what I want to respond is, is anger and yet the Spirit of God transforms my heart and it's not about feelings, it's about a transformed heart. That's what he does. Is there evidence of that in your life? Is that happening in your life? And I, I challenge for you this week, submit your heart to the Lord every day. Every day. Submit your heart to the Lord. And when I say that, I'm, I, mean, I, I mean it to be nebulous. I, I mean be in his word, right? The Holy Spirit speaks through this. Right? He, the Holy Spirit uses this. To, this comes alive. Um, a buddy of mine, actually Zach, who's on our staff, we were meeting and we were actually chatting about this passage and he was talking about, man, just the difference between trying to read scripture when you're not in Christ as a textbook and so if you're in this room and you're still asking questions, there are going to be things about this book that are just a book. And if you put your faith in Christ, there's going to be things about this book that transform, that open your eyes to it. Because the Spirit of God brings this thing alive. This book, be in community, that's another way you submit your heart to the Lord. Other people who have the same Spirit of God and you're checking things and you're, man, what is this? And I have this conviction, what do you see here? And man, that, that, submit yourself. There's a whole beautiful list of God's graces that show up as disciplines that we can submit prayer and all kinds of things that we do and I want to challenge you if you want if you want to walk through more of those man please reach out to us we'd love to walk through more just some deep disciplines of what it looks like to put yourself under the Lord but here's the last thing the last evidence of of the Holy Spirit we at least see in this passage is verse 2 right off the bat in chapter 3 he said this if you remember he said let me ask you only this did you receive the Spirit by works or by works did you receive by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Which leads us to the question, Paul saying, did you receive it? The question for us is, have we received it? H- have we received the spirit of God in the first place, right? Paul says, did you receive it by works, by doing good things or by faith? They received it by faith. They know that. They're reminded of that in this book. They would have read that and been like, oh my gosh, he's right. Spirit would have convicted them as they read this letter from Paul. My hope is that for some of us, this is convicting. That we don't come into another worship service and feel good and then leave and say, but wait, I don't know if I've ever really put my faith in Christ. I've tried the Christian thing. I'm dabbling in it. I'm moral. I grew up doing it. My parents do it. My gra- whatever, whatever your story looks like, is it personal? Have you received the Holy Spirit? by putting your faith in Christ and Christ alone. And then all of those things, is he renewing your heart? Is he working around you? All of those things. And, and, and the, the juxtaposition, the little chart I'd give you here is the spirit of God is received through faith. But the spirit of man, everything else is received by just being good enough. And that doesn't work here. You're not gonna be good enough to get the spirit of God. But here's what it does. The spirit of God points to Jesus. The spirit of God points to holiness in my life. Spirit of God should start to change our life to look more and more like him. There should be holiness in my life, not to earn the spirit because I'm saying, spirit, you drive because I stink at this. It drives me more and more towards Christ likeness, hitting basically every pothole on the way there, at least in my experience, because I'm stubborn. That's what happens. And so my challenge is, my challenge is Jesus' challenge. This is Jesus' challenge to his followers. He says, repent and believe. You want to receive the Holy Spirit? Repent and believe. Repent, meaning, man, you're living one way. You're living for yourself. You're, you're going in this direction. Repent, turn. Turn from that. Believe that I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father, Jesus says, except through me. Repent and believe. Here's how we're gonna end our time. We're gonna go back up into worship here in just a second. And um, we're gonna sing two songs. And they're really 
thought, thoughtfully um, strategic. And we're gonna sing a song about the Holy Spirit. And in it, um, there's a, a line, uh, several lines that talk about your welcome here. Right, you're welcome here, flood this place. It's gonna talk about the atmosphere and, and, and all of those things. Um, I, I want us to be really careful. We're not, when we, my hope too is we're not just singing songs. What's about to happen in worship is, I hope not just singing songs, I hope it's worship. A- and I want you to know too, you can sit, you can stand, you can sing, you can just sit in the back, read lyrics. There's no right or wrong way to do this, but my hope is that our remaining time together, you do business with God, you hear God's word, you feel his spirit move and poke and tug at you in your heart, convict you of things, would you be obedient to them? And so as we sing the song, we're not asking God to fill this place in a vibey sense. Right? We're not asking, would you fall in this place and, and fill this room? What we're asking when we, when we pray the prayer that we're about to pray, if, if you're ready to pray that prayer, um, is we're saying, fill this place. Right? We're saying, fill my heart. Because here's the deal. And I am a s- broken sinner who continues to wander back to things that don't give me life. And I know you are too. And I wander back to loneliness and anxiety and discouragement and sin and worship of myself and comfort for myself over all things and all of these other things that don't look like Jesus. And so when I pray this, this worship, I say, God, fill me. I need more of you. Change my heart. Fill my heart. I want that to be the posture of what we're doing. And then we're going to go right into another song because what happens when the Spirit is in us is He gives us the power to profess what we believe. What we believe, the theology of what we believe, that we believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that they are our hope. We believe in a resurrection. And so we're going to end our time. If it's true for you to be able to stand and with your voice or even silently in your seat, that your heart would say, I believe you. That's our hope. Would God do what only God could do? Let me pray. Father, we're grateful for you. We love you. (laughs) And we love you because you first loved us. You did this. You loved us when we were just broken, rebellious kids. And honestly, God, I look at my life and there's still parts of my life that are still this broken, rebellious kid. Yet your grace is good. Yet your grace is enough yet the salvation that you offered through Christ is powerful to redeem me from the curse that I was under, that we were under. God, we believe. We believe in you. You, our Father, that we were designed to be in relationship and sent his Son, the second person of the Trinity, that those who believe might be filled with the Holy Spirit. God, would that be true for us? Would you help us increase that Submit to that, listen to that, and be forever changed for your glory in the name of Jesus. Amen.